I originally intended to title today's episode Big Pet Food, The Wild Wild West, and then I realized that was disparaging to our nation's history. The reality is more like Big Pet Food is a funhouse maze of deceit. Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Welcome back, Pet Parent. I'm so glad you're here with me today because this fun house maze, as I've uh, deemed it today, (laughs) is really confusing and difficult for the average pet parent to navigate. Um, actually much more difficult than a carnival fun house because you can make it through a carnival fun house and here's the thing you can make it through the deceit (laughs) um, from the pet food industry it takes a lot of patience money because you actually have to pay to access definitions of what goes into pet food (laughs) that's fun Um, And the reality is, so the FDA is in charge, uh, in the United States, is in charge of food and drug. Well, they have given a lot, almost all, regulatory power over to AFCO, which if you haven't heard before is AAFCO. So let me, I have a ton of notes here, Um, FDA, so. FDA's partnership, this is from the FDA website, FDA's partnership with local and state agencies and AFCO. AFCO is the Association of American Feed Control Officials. FDA and local state agencies all play a role in regulating pet food and participate in the AFCO Association of American Feed Control Officials. While AFCO itself has no regulatory authority, this voluntary association of local, state, and federal feed control officials works to promote a safe feed supply by developing definitions for ingredients used in animal feed and pet food, having definitions helps ensure that the ingredients are uniform and safe for the animal that will eat the food, and developing uniform language that states may adopt or reference in their animal feed laws. Having common language in these laws helps with interstate commerce, allowing animal feed and pet food to flow between states without interruption. FDA staff serve on AFCO's board of directors, pet food committee, and other committees. FDA staff also act as scientific resources for AFCO and local and state feed control officials. By helping FDA's limited resources go farther and be used more efficiently, these partnerships are vital to effectively regulating pet food and ensuring safe food for animals. So basically, there's a lot of, you handle this. No, this is your responsibility. No, you handle this. No, this is your responsibility. There's a lot of that going on. (laughs) And here's something that now that I've kind of given you a brief description of what AFCO is, this whole partnership between Big Pet Food, the FDA, and AFCO is so shady that Eminem should sue. <laughs> like, it's shady AF, guys. So I've got, I have a ton of notes here because there was so much that I want to tell you about how shady Big Pet Food is um, that, do, 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 I do want you to know that at the end of today's episode, I'm going to get a pen and paper ready, Is I want you to get a pen and paper ready, because at the end of today's episode, I'm going to give you a list of words to look for on pet food labels and the meanings of those words so you can better understand, because the words used on pet food labels do not mean the same thing they, mean, they typically mean in the English language. I told you that was shady. 
Now, you know, we've talked in the past about ingredient quality. We've talked about our lack thereof. We've talked about the salt divide. Um, and so just a brief recap so that I'm not getting too much into detail. The quality of ingredients that are going into your pet's food is generally subpar unless you are specifically buying a food that is labeled as human grade. Um, there, you're not getting the same quality of food that you buy for yourself unless you are buying human grade, which is pretty rare in the pet food industry. So there are a lot, a lot, even if they started with a quality ingredient, the high heat processing and the rendering processes that uh, pet food uses, most pet food companies, not all, um, but most, and when I say not all, I'm talking about the fresh food companies in general. Some might, but not all, will um, use these rendering processes. So let me describe to you kind of what this is. This is from Dr. Karen Becker. The following is a description of the type of raw product pet food renders deal in from a 2004 report to Congress. Renderers annually convert 47 billion pounds or more of raw animal materials into approximately 18 billion pounds of products. Sources for these materials include meat slaughtering and processing plants, the primary one, dead animals from farms, ranches, feedlots, marketing barns, animal shelters, and other facilities, and fats, grease, and other food waste from restaurants and stores. Renderers drive around in specially designed trucks picking up dead farm and ranch animals as well as dead pets from animal shelters. They also collect fat, grease, and other human food waste from food outlets that goes into pet food. The rendering process involves combining raw product, which will be de defined in just a minute, in huge containers and grinding the mixture down to chips or shreds. The mixture is then cooked at 220 degrees to 270 degrees Fahrenheit for up to an hour, which separates the meat from the bone. The grease, also called tallow, rises to the top, is skimmed off the mixture, and becomes the mystery animal fat frequently found on pet food ingredient labels. The remaining product is put in a press, which sque squeezes out all the moisture and pulverizes the material into a powder. Shaker screens are used to separate excess hair and large bone chips from the powder. The result is meat and bone meal added to pet food formulas. So um, the raw product is actually what I had just described to you a moment ago, the 47 billion pounds that are converted into approximately 18 billion pounds of product um, of which the sources are dead animals from farms, ranches, feedlots, um, dead animals from um, animal shelters and other facilities and the greases and fats and things collected from restaurants and stores. That is what they mean by raw product. So that is, in a nutshell, the rendering process. And multi most pet foods, when we are thinking about kibble product, the dry, um, shelf-stable, which is a whole other issue, um, product that most people are feeding to their pets go through three to four of these rendering processes, high heat rendering processes. So there's little to no nutrition left in this meat <laughs> product, at our animal protein product at the end of all of the rendering processes, which means that they have to then add back in the vitamins and nutrients to meet, meet AFCO minimum guidelines for nutrition, depending on whether it's a dog or a cat food, that varies slightly. So they have to add back in vitamins and minerals. Most pet food companies do this with synthetic vitamins and minerals called a premix. Um, of which the overwhelming majority, over 90%, uh, is made in China. Now, 
that's not necessarily an issue. For me, it's an issue, but for you, it may not be an issue, and that's okay. Um, the issue really is that these large pet food companies are supposed to test the premix when they get it to make sure it is accurate, that it uh, has the nutrients as labeled, and nothing more and nothing less. And then once they add it back, once they add the premix in and they get a finished product, they are then again supposed to test to make sure that the nutritional value is there, nothing more, nothing less. They almost never do this. So you see things like excessive vitamin D recalls. It happens all the time because they're not testing the premix and then testing the end product before it goes to the consumer. So there is a ton, a ton, a ton of marketing going into that bag of food or even that can of food that you buy for your pet. And in fact, most of the label is marketing. Susan Thixton on um, Truth About Pet Food has an incredible breakdown of how much regulation actually goes into the uh, packaging and the labels on the, the foods that you buy for your pets. And it is minimal. Well over 90% of that packaging is all marketing. And so Dr. Karen Becker put out a blog post about some of the, some of the um, buzzwords that you should be very, very wary of. And she's saying big pet food spends big money on marketing, which is why it's so important for pet parents to learn to spot the spin because they are certainly spinning <laughs> um, the truth. Pet food producers describe their formulas as natural. As a purchaser of their products for your dog or cat, you should be aware there is nothing natural about ultra processed pet or human food. So here is the definition of natural. If you use the word natural on a food label, it is supposed to mean existing in or derived from nature, not made or caused by humankind. And understand that processed food does not qualify as natural. However, pet food companies get away with a lot more um, because they are not held to the same standards as human foods. These pet food manufacturers also described rendered extruded formulas with dozens of added animal feed grade ingredients as clean pet food. As a savvy consumer and pet parent, you recognize that ultra processed diets designed for extended shelf life can't possibly be clean. Another example, rice bran is described by pet food producers as a superfood for pets. You, however, know that it's a highly problematic, biologically inappropriate ingredient. So, a lot of pet food companies are using these buzzwords, natural, clean, superfoods, because they are not held to the same standards as human foods. They are held to the standards of feed, not food. Uh, pet food is also allowed to use what they call 4D animals. So if you've ever heard the term 4D, it means that the animal is dead, diseased, disabled, or dying prior to slaughter. It might be chicken or it might be turkey, geese, buzzard, seagull, unidentified roadkill with wings, or a pet bird euthanized as an animal shelter, and they can call it poultry, basically, on a label. So poultry doesn't necessarily mean chicken, even if they are advertising a big, beautiful piece of chicken on the cover, on the, the face of that bag or can. They also have their own definitions for byproducts. So here is the AFCO definition of chicken byproduct meal. Chicken byproduct meal consists of the dry, ground, rendered, clean parts of the carcass of slaughtered chicken, such as necks, feet, undeveloped eggs and intestines, exclusive of feathers except in such amounts as might occur unavoidable in good processing practices. 
Uh, Dr. Becker says chicken meal is vastly different from chicken byproduct meal. The distinction between good, decent pet food ingredients and poor ingredients is a crucially important one. Trying to decipher an ingredient label to determine the quality of a pet food is challenging to say the least. And one wonders if the word play among industry insiders is deliberate. I actually think it is. As I said, they be shady. Here are some kibble myths that we need to debunk right now. The first myth, kibble cleans pets' teeth. Oh my goodness, this is the furthest thing from the truth. In fact, it is starches and carbohydrate and it actually sticks to your pet's teeth and promotes tartar buildup. I don't quite know how people have decided that it cleans teeth when it literally does the opposite, but here's what Dr. Becker has to say. Dry, extruded diets have been promoted as helping to keep pets teeth clean but this is utter nonsense kibble is no better for your dogs or cats teeth than crunchy human snacks are for your teeth it would never occur to you to eat a handful of peanut brittle or granola to remove plaque and tartar from your teeth and the idea that dry food keeps your pets teeth clean is just as silly so the next myth is that kibble is better nutrition for your pets also not true it is not species appropriate it doesn't have moisture <laughs> um, we need moisture to live so do our dogs and cats so here's what dr karen becker says based on the survey results nearly half of pet owners at least somewhat agree that dry foods are healthier than canned pet food for purposes of clarity, when I refer to dry food here, I'm referring to extruded kibble, not minimally processed, freeze-dried, or dehydrated pet food, which in theory is also dry food. The reality is that ultra-processed feed-grade kibble is one of the least healthy pet foods on the market today. Many pet parents who feed kibble love the simplicity of buying it in bulk and simply pouring it into their dogs or cats bowls at mealtime. But one of the many problems with this convenience pet food is it doesn't store well. No complete and balanced pet food exists that is also shelf stable. Let me say that again. No complete and balanced pet food exists that is also shelf stable. One example, as soon as a bag of kibble is opened, important dietary fats in the food start to go rancid, and long-term consumption of rancid fats can obviously negatively impact your pet's health. Um, this is one of the things that I talk to my in-home clients about all the time, because when I ask them, inevitably, um, what they're feeding, they go in their pantry and they pull out this giant bag um, that is open and not stored in anything you know else. It's just an open bag on the floor in the pantry um, of kibble. And I'm like, do you like eating rancid fats? Because your pet doesn't either. <laughs> um, so it's very very important that we understand that this is it's complex yes but once we get our heads wrapped around it and we know what to look for we can make better decisions to help support the health of our pet um, i do want to read you a little bit more in this particular blog post from dr karen becker um, more problems with kibble the majority of dry pet food is a blend of poor quality meats agricultural leftovers, byproducts of the human food industry, and synthetic vitamins and minerals. In addition, most kibble contains a large amount of high glycemic corn, wheat, rice, or potato, grains and starches that offset crucial nutrients found in fresh meat and create metabolically stressful insulin, glucogen, and cortisol spikes throughout the day. In fact, many popular grain-free diets have a higher glycemic index than regular kibble due to the excessive amounts of starchy ingredients such as potatoes, peas, lentils, and tapioca used in the formulas. As we know, carbs break down into sugar, which fuels degenerative conditions such as diabetes, obesity, and cancer. Um, to make matters worse, the poor quality proteins and fats used in most kibble when processed at high temperatures create cancerous 
byproducts, including advanced glycation end products, which we call AGEs, advanced glycation end products, and advanced lipoxidation end products, ALEs, that have been linked to early aging and a myriad of serious and common degenerative conditions. The meat that goes into extruded pet food is put through at least four high temperature cooking processes, leaving the digestibility, absorbability, and overall amino acid content highly questionable. I want to move on to something else on the packaging of your foods. There are nutrient profiles that AFCO has deemed uh, required for dog food and cat food. And they state what nutrients dog food needs, what nutrients cat food needs, and the levels of each that are required to uh, meet AFCO minimum guidelines. Now, when you pick up a bag of food or a can of food, there is going to be something called a guaranteed analysis on the back of that label. And what's really, really important to know is that a guaranteed analysis is not a nutrition analysis or a nutritional analysis. So if you are doing your research and you are contacting pet food companies to find out specifically what that food tests for in nutritional value and they refer you to the guaranteed analysis on that bag of food or that can of food they are avoiding and they are expecting you to not know the difference because a nutritional analysis is something very different that if you call and ask them for it they should be providing to you it means that they have sent their food off to a third-party laboratory had it tested to make sure it meets the minimum standards that AFCO requires the nutritional analysis is something that while these companies should be doing it and should be uh, able to provide to you if they are not willing or if they try to skirt the question and say, oh, it's listed there on the bag, that is not the same thing. Just because that guaranteed analysis is on the bag doesn't mean (laughs) that that's exactly what is in that bag of food. Only the nutritional analysis can tell you that. And if they won't provide it to you or expect you to accept the guaranteed analysis as the nutritional analysis, it's because they either don't want to provide it to you because it doesn't make them look good, (laughs) they haven't done what they're supposed to do, that food isn't what it's supposed to be, or they just think you're dumb and they are trying to blow you off. So this is a a statement from Susan Thixton at Truth About Pet Food, and if you haven't Uh, subscribe to Truth About Pet Food, or if you've never heard of Susan Thixton, let me tell you, she is the number one advocate for your pet in the pet food world. Like, number one. (laughs) And Truth About Pet Food should be on everyone's radar. We should all know this. We should all be following this if we have a pet. This particular blog post, which is incredibly detailed and in-depth about um, showing you what is actually regulated on a pet food label and what isn't because like over 90% is marketing and not actually true to what what's in that bag. Um, She says, regulatory authorities do not regularly validate that the listed manufacturer actually manufactured the brand. They do not regularly validate the weight of the product. They do not regularly validate the pet food actually meets the claimed nutrient profile. They do not regularly validate the ingredients stated on the label are actually included in the pet food. And they do not validate that the recommended feeding directions adequately provide a pet with the proper levels of nutrients. And significantly, none of the marketing claims of any pet food is ever validated by regulatory authorities. To me, that's pretty strong. That's strong. And I find it to also be very, very true. 
What I also want you to know, uh, pet food also uses a lot of plant protein to supplement the fact that there isn't adequate animal protein in the diet, which is not only a shame, but I think a, a huge injustice. If you haven't listened to my previous podcast episode about the carnivore in your home, I hope you go back and listen to that because it is vitally crucial that our dog and cat receive animal protein as the majority of their diets. Real, fresh, animal protein. So a lot of pet food companies are using plant protein to supplement. This does not translate the same way in our dogs and cats bodies it doesn't translate the same way in our bodies either by the way they also do something called ingredient splitting so if you haven't heard about ingredient splitting if you read a pet food label and you see things like um, i just have a pet food label in front of me and it lists um, i'm just going through whole grain corn soybean holes barley whole grain wheat corn gluten meal, soybean meal, rice, poultry by byproduct meal, glycerin, egg and chicken flavor, beef fat, poultry and pork digest. Um, I'm looking to see if it, so uh, corn is on here twice. They have whole grain corn and then they have corn gluten meal. You might also see um, pea protein and then pea whey. Um, you might see uh, wheat in a number of ways. You, you might see rice in a number of ways. There are lots of different ingredients that they split so that they don't have to list it as the first ingredient on the bag. And the reason for this is when you are reading the ingredient label, the first ingredient listed is supposed, it has to be, the majority percentage. And then as the ingredient label continues, the percentage goes down. So in an effort to make sure that corn or peas or potatoes, whatever it may be, isn't the first ingredient, they split those ingredients and say that it's pea whey and pea protein or, or something like that. Or in this case, um, grain, whole grain corn and corn gluten meal, they've split it. And the reason that they do that is so that it doesn't wind up being the very first ingredient. In the label because they know in the mind it's, it's a psychological trick they know in the mind of consumers that consumers don't want to see that they want to see some sort of um, meat as the first ingredient even if it is a byproduct or a byproduct meal uh, because most consumers just aren't educated fortunately you are becoming more and more educated so we, here we are, we're, we've gotten to the point where you need your pen and paper because we're going to talk about some words that pet food manufacturers use that do not have the same meaning <laughs> that you use in the English language. They mean something totally different because AFCO has defined them differently. And as I was saying earlier, to get the definitions from AFCO, you have to pay, I think it's like $250 um, it might have even gone up to get the booklet, the pamphlet that explains the definition. Yeah, yeah, I know. How crazy is that? You're expected to be an educated consumer and buy these products, yet they're not providing you the definitions of the words they're using um, on the labels of these products. That's, I told you guys, they're shady AF. Okay, so let's go, let's start with flavor. When you see the word flavor, on a package, a pet food package, it says, this may be a chemical or food ingredient added to impart a specific flavor. Animal digest, a rendered product of fats and meat treated with heat enzymes and or acids to form concentrated natural flavors, generally not high quality, is commonly used for flavoring. Many treats are labeled bacon flavor or filet mignon flavor, Believe me when I say you won't find real bacon or filet mignon on the ingredient list for these products. Okay, the word with. This term means there is 3% of the named ingredient in the formulation. For instance, with chicken means the percentage, percentage of chicken in the formula must equal 3%. Don't be fooled into thinking you are buying a product that has high meat content because if it says 
with chicken or with beef or with pork, 3%. Uh, dinner, platter, entree, recipe, nuggets, or formula. This product must contain 25% of the named ingredients. So a chicken dinner cat food must contain 25% chicken. Notice if it said cat food with chicken, it would only be 3% chicken. It's up to the consumer to know the difference in the names. If a whole meat is used instead of a meat meal, the meat ingredient may only be 10% of the ingredient list as water weight counts as part of the 25%. This is why some people argue that a meat or poultry meal would provide more actual meat in the pet food product than a whole meat source. And this, by the way, is from a blog post from um, Dr. Judy Morgan's Naturally Healthy Pets dated January 21st, 2019. Um, and then there are a whole bunch of examples. So uh, an example from FDA, for example, one pet food may list meat as its first ingredient and corn as the second ingredient. The manufacturer doesn't hesitate to point out that its competitor lists corn first, meat meal is second suggesting the competitor's product has less animal source protein than its own. However, meat is very high moisture, approximately 75% water. On the other hand, water and fat are removed from the meat meal. So it is only 10% moisture. What's left is mostly protein and minerals. If we could compare both products in a dry matter basis, mathematically removing the water from both ingredients, one could see that the second product had more animal source protein from meat meal than the first product had from meat, even though the ingredient list suggests otherwise. Are you confused yet? <laughs> I bet you are. Okay, from the FDA description, in the example beef dinner for dogs, only one quarter of the product, 25%, must be beef. And beef would most likely be the third or fourth ingredient on the ingredient list because the primary ingredient is not always the named ingredient and may in fact be an ingredient that the consumer does not wish to feed. The ingredient list should always be checked before purchase. For example, a cat owner may have learned from his or her finicky feline to avoid buying products with fish in it because the cat doesn't like fish. However, a chicken formula cat food may not always be the best choice since some chicken formulas may indeed contain fish and sometimes may contain even more fish than chicken. A quick check of the ingredient list would avert this mistake. If more than one ingredient is listed in the name of the food, the two ingredients combined together must equal 25% of the formula. So a chicken and vegetable dinner must have a total of 25% chicken and vegetables, and each ingredient must make up at least 3% of the formula. That means chicken might be 13% of the formula and vegetables might make up the other 12% of the formula. The remaining 75% of the formula can be any other ingredient listed on the label ingredient panel. That means you are feeding a very low meat ingredient product. Cat food or dog food without descriptors. <laughs> These foods must contain 95% of the named ingredient, excluding water, so only 70% if using whole meat ingredients. In this instance, chicken cat food must contain 95% chicken. Chicken and liver cat food must contain 95% chicken and liver when added together. Since chicken is listed first in the name, there must be more chicken than liver. Um, Dr. Judy Morgan says, do you have all of this memorized so that you can be an informed consumer or are you satisfied with products that say 100% complete and balanced nutrition, no matter what the ingredient list includes? Well, I know I'm not. That's why I did this podcast today to show you not only how confusing it can be, but that you can get the information to know better and learn and read an ingredient panel to make informed and educated decisions for your pet. I personally found out a lot of this information after I had already made the decision to switch my pets to fresh food diets. That is just because something in my head clicked and said, why am I eating fresh food and my pets aren't? And then I started learning all of this. But for a lot of people, they have to learn at least some of what we talked about today 
and realize how insidious the pet food marketing is. Um, and because guess what? Your dog and your cat aren't buying these products off the shelves. You are, which means these pet food companies are marketing to you and they are using your psychology to trick you. <laughs> so once again, AFCO is shady AF. This was a little bit longer of a podcast, especially a solo one, <laughs> but I really wanted to get a lot of this information out to you because it is really, really important for us to know it. And I hope it was helpful and beneficial. Make sure to reach out to me on the socials and let me know um, that it was helpful. And I really appreciate you being here. If you haven't already joined the Patreon family, I hope you do so. Um, you can go to the petparentingreset.com and right there in the top navigation menu is a link to Patreon. You can join for as little as a dollar a month and it helps for me to continue to bring content like this to you. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and end today's podcast. I hope you and your pets have a wonderful rest of your day. Please give them some extra love from me. Until next time, bye guys. Oh, 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 oh.